Is Android still a toxic hell stew of vulnerabilities? The phrase comes from a ZDNet article back in 2014, and it was quoted on stage by Tim Cook at that year's iPhone launch. His point was that Android was so fragmented and updates so slow to arrive that there was no way those poor people who bought an Android phone by mistake could enjoy anywhere near the security of their iPhone owning betters. So was that ever the case? And fanboyism aside, do you need to worry that your Android phone isn't 100% secure? I'm Alex Dobie, this is XDA TV, let's get into it. Cast your mind back to the very first iPhone. It connected over 2G, had like 14 apps, and took photos with more grain and noise than a rave in an agricultural supply store. Apple made the hardware and the software. They controlled the entire experience, which meant they could push out updates without waiting on anyone else. The earliest days of Android were a little different, with a lot more cooks in the proverbial kitchen. First, Google would release a new version of Android, which was then adapted by chip makers to work on whichever CPU your phone used. Then the manufacturer got to have their way with Android, add new features or apps, and usually change a bunch of things about how it looks, often for the worse. Then you need to go to your carrier if it was a network branded phone and they'd make sure it worked on their network, while also shoveling in more bloatware just for the hell of it. But then if you were lucky, maybe six months after a new Android version launched, you as a regular person would actually get it on your phone, along with a few extras that you may or may not have wanted. For 99% of the Android ecosystem, this was how updates worked. And it was a big pain point. Kind of like ordering a fancy hamburger at a restaurant and then having to wait around while the franchise owner and the server added a bunch of weird gross toppings that you didn't ask for. The only people who weren't having their Android burgers arrive hours late with unrequested pineapple chunks and dog hair were Google Nexus owners. These phones ran vanilla Android and got updates straight from Google with no additional guff. But they represented just a tiny sliver of a slice of the ever-expanding Android pie. That situation was pretty bad for a bunch of reasons and one big one was security. Obviously, it's not great if Google or Qualcomm needs to fix a security bug further up that food chain and then you've got to wait additional months for it to actually get out to most devices. That was made worse by the nature of Android at the time and the attitude of phone makers towards updates. I remember talking to someone who used to work at one of the big phone manufacturers years and years ago and hearing how in the early 2010s, software updates for existing phones were kind of viewed as a chore, almost like you'd screwed up if you had to make one because, well, whatever you're fixing or adding should have just been in the original ROM. As a result, the update track record of pretty much everyone in the Android world back then was basically dumpster tier by today's standards. Flagships would get maybe one major OS update months later if they were lucky and security patches just weren't a thing yet. Worse, pretty much all the important core Android apps were still baked into the firmware at this point. Web browser updates, for example, would need to be packaged into an OTA and wait to be certified by the manufacturer and carrier. So if a vulnerability cropped up in the browser engine code from, say, Google, there was no way to get fixes pushed out widely or quickly. That meant different people would be stuck on different versions with different customizations and differing levels of vulnerability to malware and other nasties, hence Android fragmentation. It's worth saying that iOS was by no means free from security issues, especially during the first couple of generations of iPhone. The lack of an official app store was, after all, a big incentive for script kiddies and white hat hackers to crack open the iPhone and make it do new and exciting things. And at least one major way to jailbreak iPhones back then involved exploiting a bug in the browser. Basically, a web page could break the original iPhone's security. Difference was, Apple could plug those security holes much more quickly when they appeared and do so across a much larger chunk of the user base. Not so on the Android side. So that was the toxic hell stew that Google was allegedly serving up in the days of Android versions 4 and 5. Looking back with 2020 hindsight, it's easy to say Google should have done more to retain control over Android or put systems in place from the get-go to help updates flow more freely and more frequently. But remember, back when Android was first being developed in 2007, the world was a very different place. The smartphones that did exist were mainly primitive email mashing contraptions for stuffy corpos. Mobile payments were nowhere near being a reality. Uber wouldn't be founded for another two years. The humble retweet didn't even exist yet. Point is, back then, it wasn't clear how, over the following decade, so many essential everyday tasks would be tied to your phone, nor how it would become such a treasure trove of precious, hackable personal data. 
To Google's credit, an awful lot has changed over the past few years to substantially make Android more secure and get security fixes out more quickly to more people. So let's start from the top. Google Play Services is something you might have seen updating on your phone that maybe you haven't paid much attention to. But it's actually a hugely important part of how Google keeps Android secure and helps bring new features from Android 13 to your grandma's Galaxy S5 that hasn't gotten firmware updates in years. Play Services is a system app, meaning it's a VVIP and has top level access to everything on your phone. It can do way more than a regular app you download from the Play Store, like install or delete other apps or remotely wipe your device. System apps like Play Services need to be loaded onto your phone by the manufacturer, but once they're there, they can be updated automatically in the background. That means new versions can securely add new features and functionality. And Play Services has tentacles all over the OS, which is why, for example, Android 13's Secure Photo Picker feature could be rolled out to phones running much older versions of the OS without any new firmware needing to be installed. Play Services also includes Google Play Protect, Android's OS-level anti-malware capability that can stop malicious apps before they're installed or nuke them if they're already there. That covers you for 99% of what an actual bad app in the form of an APK file might try to do. Another important thing about Play Services is it supports absolutely ancient versions of Android. Google typically only drops support for Play Services on Android versions that are around 10 years old. Right now, it's summer of 2023, and the current version of Play Services is supported all the way back to 2013's Android 4.4 KitKat. That seemingly random bit of nerdy trivia is important because it helps you stay reasonably secure even on much older versions of Android. And that in itself is a big part of the Android security strategy. More on that in a bit. First though, a bit of a mini tangent. Google Play services actually played a significant but largely hidden role in a major recent event. An update via Play services was the only reason Google was able to roll out the COVID-19 exposure notification system it had developed with Apple to essentially the entire Android user base in one fell swoop. Without Play services, that kind of endeavor would have taken months and not reached nearly as many people. In fact, it's kind of wild to think that Google's efforts to fix Android fragmentation nearly a decade earlier likely indirectly ended up saving quite a few lives during the pandemic. Okay, so actual malware apps are one thing. But there are other ways that bad actors can try and take control of your phone or steal your data. I mentioned browser exploits before, and now both the Chrome browser and WebView code for web content within other apps are both updated by the Google Play Store. In fact, this applies to a whole bunch of different parts of Android that once required a full firmware update. Others include the Google Phone Dialer, Android Messages, and countless behind-the-scenes apps. So say a nasty browser exploit is discovered today in 2023, where a malicious web page could crash your phone or steal your passwords or make the Starbucks app mess up your order. It wouldn't matter which version of Android you're on. Google could push out updates via the Play Store covering both Chrome itself and any other app that displays web content. Back in the days of the toxic hell stew, deploying the same fix would have needed a full firmware update to go out to every Android phone. A lot more work for a lot more people, and it would have taken months or even years instead of days. Another kind of exploit was big news in the Android security world in 2015. The stage fright bug affected the part of Android that handled rendering of images and video. A photo that had been tampered with in the right way could do bad things to your phone. This was a big problem because back then, that stage fright component couldn't be updated without a full firmware update. Again, a lot of extra work, certification, and waiting around while potentially the digital equivalent of a haunted painting could crack your phone wide open. The fallout from that spooky stage fright security scare was twofold. First, Google started issuing monthly security patches for Android, tying your level of security to a specific date. And it got serious about making Android more modular, so chunks of the OS, like stage fright, could be updated by the Play Store without needing a full firmware update. New Android security patches still go out every month to this day, and they cover older versions of the OS too, not just the very latest. So even if a phone is still on Android 11 or 12, it can still be protected. Generally, Google Pixel and Samsung flagships get security patches first, with others like Motorola jogging sweatily behind the rest of the ecosystem, releasing the contractual bare minimum of one patch per quarter. That's the other side of this equation. Google now legally requires phone makers to commit to a minimum level of support if they want Android with Google services on their devices. Back in 2018, The Verge reported Google mandates two years of security patches going out at least once every 90 days. 
These days, popular brands like Samsung and OnePlus promise four years of OS updates plus five years of security patches, possibly with some encouragement from Google behind the scenes. But firmware updates still involve a lot of engineering legwork, especially when it's a big update like a whole new OS version. Android doesn't look like Samsung's One UI or Oppo's Color OS when it leaves Google's Mountain View campus, right? And in the early days, you as Samsung or Oppo would need to incorporate that whole new version of Android into your customized fork of the previous version. It's kind of like trying to swap out some of the ingredients once a meal is already cooked. You end up having to almost start over from scratch. Google's solution? Basically a TV dinner plate. You serve that meal in two different sections. You separate out the manufacturer's customizations, all the One UI or ColorOS stuff, from the core of the OS. And that means you can more easily update one without messing too much with the other. This whole endeavor is called Project Treble, and while you can't see it on your phone, you might have noticed how the Android device you own today gets updates a fair bit more quickly than the one you used seven or eight years ago. On top of that, Google started sharing future Android versions with OEMs at a much earlier stage. So by the time the first developer previews of Android 14 were public, the likes of Samsung had probably been peeking at it behind the scenes for a couple of months or so. So that's all well and good, but people often keep phones a lot longer than just a couple of years. Pushing out new firmware is still a non-trivial amount of work, and those engineers don't work for free. So Project Mainline in 2019 made Android itself more modular, with software modules for things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, media handling, and much more. These modules can be directly updated by Google or the manufacturer separately without the rigmarole of going through the whole firmware update process. If you've ever seen a Google Play system update on your phone, that's what that is. Think of it like this. If a light bulb blows in your home, you can now just change the bulb, whereas before you'd go outside, burn your house to the ground, and build a new one on top of it. Mobile security scares still happen, even in 2023. But the difference today versus Android's toxic hell stew times is that there are plenty of ways to neutralize them. Take 2015's stage fright vault, for example. The part of Android affected by that bug is a project mainline module today and easily updated all the way back to Android 10 without a full firmware update. And in 2014, there was another notorious bug called Fake ID, which could allow a malicious app to impersonate one with special permissions, potentially exposing your data to an attacker. If something like that happened today, Play Protect would stop it in its tracks, and the underlying bug could quickly be squished in a mainline update to the Android runtime module. That said, no software or device is ever completely secure. Zero-day exploits, that is, secret unpatched vulnerabilities, exist for all operating systems and are used by nation states and sold for vast sums on the black market. There are many recent examples of high-profile individuals being targeted by scarily sophisticated malware based on zero-day exploits. People like Jeff Bezos, Emmanuel Macron, and Liz Truss. In 2022, the former UK Prime Minister reportedly had to keep changing phone numbers after being hacked, supposedly by Russian agents. Eventually, her device was deemed to be so completely compromised that it was locked away in basically the smartphone equivalent of the Chernobyl sarcophagus. Why was she changing numbers? It's possible her phone was targeted by something like Pegasus, the Israeli-made spyware that reportedly can take over an Android or iOS device just by having its phone number. Russia reportedly doesn't use foreign-made spyware, but it's likely to have its own homegrown equivalent based on similar zero-day exploits. All of which shows that 100% security is an illusion. It's unattainable, whichever device or OS you're using. But Android is way past being a toxic hell stew of vulnerabilities in the same way you could have argued it was a decade ago. And it's much better place to tackle the garden variety threats that might be encountered by those of us who aren't heads of government or the CEO of a trillion dollar company. What's more, the average person is far more likely to fall victim to social engineering or some other form of scam as opposed to getting stung by phone-based malware. This kind of fraud is on the rise in many countries, and in the UK it increased 25% between 2020 and 2022, with most cases involving computer misuse. As smartphone security has improved, you could say that the bad guys are realizing the easiest hardware to exploit is actually the squishy, meaty component attached to the screen. You. You are your phone's most important security feature, but you're also its least patchable security vulnerability. So stay safe out there, toss us a like and subscribe if you want to see more deep dives like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.